This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. The motto of the International Olympic Games is only three words long. And those three words are these. Swifter, higher, stronger. That symbolizes the striving, the aspiration, the idealism of mankind at its best. And each person on this planet possesses within himself just such a hungering after perfection, just such a craving for the best, as is symbolized by that. For within your mortal mind, there dwells a fragment of the living God, a spark of the divine, and if you will choose to follow that gleam, your life will be transformed. 2,000 years ago, Christ told the story of a woman who lost a coin and swept the entire house in her quest to find it. And so he said, does the God of this universe seek you? Not that he doesn't know where you are, not in the least, but rather that God seeks for your fellowship, for your love, for your spiritual awakening to the genuine reason and purpose of your human life, of being alive. You are valuable, infinitely valuable to God because... You are a child of this father, and what good father does not deeply love his child? To this you may reply, but human beings are so imperfect. How could a perfect God love such immature, uncomprehending, and imperfect children as we? For the very same reason that any good parent can love his children, simply because they are his children. And a good parent, far from being repulsed or angered by the mistakes of his children, will even love them all the more in their awkwardness and imperfection. There's one sixth grade school teacher who loves to save up some of the most interesting of the wrong answers which your students write on their examination papers. Here's some examples. One student wrote, The climate is hottest next to the creator. Another one, Strategy is when you don't let the enemy know that you're out of ammunition, but keep on firing. Another student wrote, A virgin forest is woods where the hand of man has never set foot. And another sixth grader put down on a paper, The general direction of the Alps is straight up. Those examination answers may have been incorrect. But what loving father or mother in reading them could have failed to be charmed by the creative ingenuity, at least, revealed in them? Good parents do not detest their children because of their immaturity or lack of knowledge. They love them. A parent loves his child not because that child is especially intelligent, but because that child is his child. And such is the nature of God's love for you. God loves you not because you're perfect, but because you are his son or his daughter. And that is quite enough for him. And it ought to be quite enough for you. Believe that love of God. Claim it with all your faith. And both your feeling about life and your very life itself will change. The fact that God is infinite and eternal in no way diminishes his personal interest in you as an individual. Astronomers report that on a relatively clear night, the average person could count approximately 2,000 stars in the sky. But our most advanced telescopes reveal that, in fact, there are literally trillions, with a T, trillions more stars beyond those. The celestial blur of light scientists term the Milky Way is estimated by astronomers to be a huge wheel-like gathering of perhaps 100 billion stars in itself. And in addition to that, there are thousands of more galaxies evident across the nighttime sky. And yet, even in such a vast and far-stretching universe as this, the Creator God, who is the first source and center of all things and beings, who is the controller and infinite upholder of all reality, who is the stability of all statics and the dynamism of all change, who is the immortal, invisible, eternal, one and only true God, this God knows you personally and even knows the hairs on your head. God is a father, and he loves you with an everlasting love, and his mercy endures forever. One time on an airplane flight from Los Angeles, I was seated next to a girl who worked as a waitress in a Hollywood restaurant. She told me that on clear nights, she loved to drive up into the hills overlooking L.A. 
and look at the twinkling carpet of lights lying out before her and stretching away into the blackness. She said that each time she was impressed by the thought that even though there were all those lights and more than she could count, that still there were even more people than lights. And that always she wondered how one God could really know about the lives of each of those persons who lived in that shimmering city below. There are so many. About 2,000 years ago, mankind was taught that the kingdom of God is within us, that the living spirit of the living creator indwells the mind of each of his children, that God knows our every thought and motive, our every joy and sorrow, our every plan and problem. This God knows you and loves you. And if you will only be his child in love, in faith, as you were born to be, all of time and all eternity will be for you a wonder and a joy. For you will have discovered what life was meant to be. But the choice to live that faith is yours. Once Jesus asked, what's your opinion of this? There was a man with two sons. He went to the first and said, go work in my vineyard today, my son. He said, all right. But he never went near it. Then the father approached a second son with the same request. He said, I won't. But afterward, he changed his mind, and he went. Which of these two did what their father wanted? The second, his crowd replied. And I tell you, the tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God in front of you, replied Jesus. Recently in San Francisco, a man on the street pollster asked passers-by this intriguing question, what is the most important thing in your life? A secretary answered, my husband and our marriage are the most important things in my life right now, then later on, my children. A sheet metal worker said, my family, the rapport we've been able to achieve, the balance of our life, the happiness we find in being together, this is what keeps our family together and happy. A former social worker replied, getting a degree enabled me to collect a good paycheck, but working is a bore. A man answered, my wife, being with her, enjoying my retirement, seeing old friends, that's what's important to me. To the question, what's the most important thing in your life? A high school student replied, my future. I want to be an architect, going to school, getting good grades. Oh, and of course, my family. A printer said, I think the most important thing in anyone's life would be good health. Without good health, you can't enjoy any of the other things in life. Love, friendship, wealth, they are important, but you couldn't really enjoy them without health. And finally, a retired man said, the most important thing in his life was, and I quote, myself. The rest of the world, forget it, he said. I don't care about anybody else. I've known a lot of women, but I never got married. I don't believe in marriage. The only person in the world I care about is myself, and there's nothing wrong with that. End of quote. Intriguing question. What is the most important thing in life? And how can you suppose that you are living very wisely or very well unless and until you've answered that question? A football game is not particularly meaningful without a goal line. A basketball game only makes sense if there's a basket. A game of horseshoes is less than interesting unless there's a steel stake driven into the ground, a place to aim, a purpose to it all. And explicitly the same is true of the living of your life. If you're bored by it all... It may very well be that you're bored by it all because never in all of your years of existence have you found a purpose in it all. What is really, what is the most important thing in life? What ought you to seek first and foremost during the days of your years? What is the highest quest of mortal existence? 2,000 years ago, there lived a man who answered that question. As it has never been answered before or since, what ought you to seek from life? Seek first, he taught the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. But seek first the kingdom of God. At this point, you may feel even more confused than before. It may sound as if Christ simply answered one riddle with another one, and a more bewildering one at that. What does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God? What is this kingdom of God? Jesus deals with that in teaching the Lord's Prayer, where he says to pray, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom of God is a poetic way of describing the will of God. A kingdom is a domain of government, a realm over which someone rules. And the kingdom of God is the rule of God in the hearts, the souls, and the minds of mankind. 
The kingdom of God, said Jesus, is within you. The Spirit of God indwells the mortal mind, and the kingdom of God is therefore the will of God, dominant, exalted, and transcendent within the consciousness of the individual. When above all other things you desire to live by and do the will of God, you are seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all other things of consequence will be added to you, for the Spirit of God is with you and within you. Believe that and you will discover resources of unsuspected power in your life. Recently in the state of Maine, a teenaged farm worker was pinned down underneath a fallen tractor which tipped over while he was working. United Press Wire Service reported this. The tractor weighed 3,000 pounds. But another teenaged boy, a 6 foot 18 year old, heard the screams of the crushed farm worker, ran over to him, grabbed hold of that 3,000 pound tractor with his bare hands and proceeded to lift it up off the pinned boy long enough for him to wriggle free. He was later reported in good condition at the hospital with a fractured hip and internal injuries. The other boy, the one who lifted the tractor, was apparently none the worse for his ordeal either. It is inevitably astonishing to discover what a person can do when he has to or in an emergency. Because these are the situations which reveal the full range of human potentials, not only physically, as in this instance, but mentally, spiritually, psychologically as well. There is a range of possibilities within you which can literally astound you if you will learn to utilize them. For the kingdom of God is within you, a spiritual source of astonishing cosmic energy the power to love, to discover good, to live in peace and purpose here, now, and for all eternity. All this is potential in you. If only you will choose to synchronize your mind and will with the mind and will of the infinite eternal God, whose son or daughter, know it or not, you are. If you're interested in these topics, write to us. We want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviated SRI. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address. SRI, Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Seven Principles of Prayer, Life After Death, What Does Happen When You Die? If you're interested in these topics, no cost, no charge, no obligation, nobody's going to come to your door with an attache case and try to sell you something, simply write to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute Box, 3080 Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.